Good morning, everybody, and a real warm welcome on this lovely spring morning here to church. May the Lord bless you today as you join with us to worship him. And a couple of things just to say right at the beginning. First of all, uh, Alpha starts this morning. So if you signed up for Alpha and you've suddenly forgotten this morning, it's straight through the back doors and across the corridor in the Cypress and Cedar Room. Do make your way there and uh, you'll have a great morning, I'm sure. The other thing I've noticed is the clock says it's half past nine. So I reckon that probably gives me an extra hour's preaching this morning. <laughs> so buckle up and get ready for a fantastic time. Uh, and we'll go for it this morning. But it's lovely to welcome every one of you right now uh, in the service. May the Lord bless you, those who are here and those who are online. We're going to start with a hymn again this morning. And then after the hymn, we have someone sharing testimony. And Andrew and uh, Chris will come and share about um, uh, uh, freedom in Christ, uh, the impact it's had on them, and the blessing we believe it's going to be. And then after that, we'll have a scripture reading together. So first a hymn, let's stand together and sing this great old hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.
God, our loving Heavenly Father, we stand in awe of you together this morning because of who you are and all that you have done for us. We pray that, that the words of that song might be true in every heart that is gathered here and every heart that is listening online, that we might worship you from our very hearts, not necessarily all the day long, but consistently and regularly, bringing you the praise and the glory and the honour that you so richly deserve. We have come this morning to worship you. We've come to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in this place. We've come to open our hearts and lives again to your word and to open our lives to the moving of your Holy Spirit that as a result of today, you will take more glory to yourself and we will live in a way which honours you day by day. So we thank you for this privilege. We thank you for our salvation this morning. We thank you that we know what it is to be born again by the Holy Spirit and to be washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know what it is to have hope for today and bright hope for tomorrow. We know what it is to be held in the hands of the living God. Receive our praise. Receive our thanks. Receive our worship today. We ask these things through your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats this morning. Great again to have all of you with us. And I'm going to invite Chris Rodmel and Andrew on a prayer to come and share with us a little about, bit about the course that will be running Freedom in Christ. And Andrew is one of our elders and he'll be sharing about his involvement in that in a few minutes. But first of all, over to Chris. Thank you so much. Hello. Ooh, you're a scary bunch. <laughs> How I um, can tell you about 40 years of walking with God um, in just a few minutes, but I'm going to try. I'm Chris Rodmel. <clears throat> I came back to BCC four years ago after 25 years in Nottingham. I met my husband David at Fraysthorpe Camp. We were married in 1994 at Bridge Street Church. And he whisked me off to Nottingham with my boys, Ben and Tom, who were then 10 and 11 years old. And two years later, we had Sam, who's now, yesterday, turned 27. In 2018, David died. After four years of caring for him. But what was next for my life? My future? I'm not one for going back. But whatever life looks like now, I know that God says he's got a plan to prosper me, not to harm me. Plans to give me hope and a future. Amen. And I had to hang on to that. So why Leeds? I had two sons and five grandchildren here. And in BCC there were people who loved me. So now with new friends and home group family and people who've believed in me and encouraged me to emerge from that, that cave of grief that I've been in, I just want to thank you all. So back to the beginning. As a child, I was painfully shy, scared of people and situations with no self-worth. I was brought up in a Christian home. My mum and dad were active in the Methodist church. And every day I sat on my dad's knee and read the Bible and prayed. I don't remember a time when I didn't believe in God. But Jesus wasn't Lord of my life. He wasn't in the driving seat. And as a teenager, I thought, it'll be all right when I get married. It'll be all right when I have children. We often think, get into that trap, don't we? It'll be all right when. But it wasn't. It led me to marrying somebody who was abusive. To be honest, I didn't think I was worth any better. And we'd been married for four years with two young children and worsening domestic violence and abuse. I believed that when I got married, it was a promise to God for life but it had got to the point when only God could help. And that weekend in May 1984, we had a dramatic incident. My life was threatened with a gun. 
and I called for help to my mum and to Bridge Street Church. I was 24. That weekend, both me and my husband responded in church and asked Jesus into our lives. For me, it was a radical transformation. I found in Jesus the love I'd always longed for. It felt like all the God stuff that had been taught in me was in there and Jesus became real. He was Lord of my life. But my husband was not able to get stuck into the truth of God's word and he stopped going to church after a while and things deteriorated at home. But as the abuse grew, my faith in God grew. I was believing for his journey with God and for our marriage, but I was exhausted. I was trying to maintain stability in a volatile situation for Ben and Tom, who were then three and one. One particularly difficult day, God encouraged me from the song Amazing Grace. Through many dangers, toils and snares, you have already come. It's grace that brought you safe this far, and grace will lead you home. Four years after we'd become Christians, my husband just suddenly left. I was devastated. I felt like I'd lost my testimony. But then I realised that my testimony is so much deeper. That absolutely nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. I'm missing out so much, you know, about God's faithfulness. You can't just say it in, in a few minutes. I was a single parent for six years, and then I met David. And in Nottingham, we were part of a church plant for 20-plus years, a wonderful church family. We were loving God's people, loving the lost, building church, and he was a good man. The theme he was teaching us was God, God was teaching us was God's grace in that time. In the late noughties, I'd become tired, though, and discouraged. I felt like we'd not seen the fruit that we'd believed for. And my call to God was, there must be more than this. There was a song, there must be more than this. And in 2012, through a dream, which is not always an immediate moment. There's a build-up always to it, isn't there? But in a one-sentence summary, God was saying to me, if you want to build a bigger house... Bigger and higher, you're going to need stronger foundations to support more weight. Foundations of faith, belief. And he opened my eyes at that point in that dream as to a few things of what that meant. And I said, yes, Lord. We pray the Lord's Prayer. May your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, build your kingdom in me in this place, in our city, in our nation, in the world, build your kingdom. And Lord, build my foundations, my beliefs strong enough for the weight of what you want to do. God began showing me what it means to live this Christian life while seated in Christ in heavenly places, living and believing from God's perspective. I had an urgency to teach what God was showing me. I'm not academic. I can't write a course. But somebody said to me, that sounds like the Freedom in Christ course. And it was a tool, a tool to teach what God was teaching me. And I taught the Freedom in Christ course eight or nine times in that church, in different contexts, seeing people set free in many ways and bringing freedom and fruitfulness. So back where I started here. I met Andrew and his wife Andrea at the Wakefield Home Group. And I found that they'd lived half a mile away from us in Nottingham. Andrew had done the Freedom in Christ course himself. And we are so excited to bring the course to you at BCC. We are very different people, very different gifts, different experience. But hopefully we complement one another and that the Freedom in Christ course will complement the great discipleship that's already happening here at BCC. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone.
So I, I, had, I did a Freedom in Christ course many years ago. Um, can, and can I have this slide, please? And that's, for many years, I grew up trying to please God. I was always trying to perform and do things that would make God happy with me. So I thought that the, the way to get God's love was to do stuff. So I, I was always doing stuff. And I was bounded by legalism to the point that if I didn't pray getting up from bed, I felt I had sinned against God. If I didn't read my Bible, I felt I had sinned against God. So I, I, strugg I really struggled and thinking each time, does God really love me? And will God's love depart from me if I did anything that was not, not sin necessarily, but anything that was not consistent with the pattern of, of, of Christian life? For example, if I didn't fast enough during the week, until I encountered the freedom in Christ, in Christ course, where I realized that it is not me, it is not my performance that makes God love me. God has loved me anyway, and so he enables me to perform. He's reversing that, that order, that I'm not trying to, please, to, 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 to get God's love. He already loved me. And now I am responding to his love by doing the things that pleases him, the things that he really loves. And that's what the Freedom in Christ course is, is, is all about. It is helping people to break free from the, the patterns and negative thoughts and, 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 and things that have held them back in the past. Helping them to recognize you know, the true identity that God has made them. And helping them to, to break free from the lies of the devil that make them feel they are inadequate, insufficient, and that God doesn't love them because of the things they've done in the past, that made them feel that Jesus' death is not sufficient, you know, to really get them to where God wants them to be. And that's why we are bringing this course to the church. It's 11 weeks altogether. It, it looks like a long, a, long, a long time, but I tell you, it's, it's worth it. It's really worth it. It's going to be held from the 12th of May to the 21st of July at Beach Room and Stewart Building, top floor, and it's the same time as the service, 10.30 to 12.30 p.m. Now, um, it's, it's broken down into, into three parts. So there's sections one to seven, you know, that, that talks, this is a block of, of sections, and there is the week eight, which is much longer. That's gonna take, it takes about six hours, and that's gonna be on the 30th of June. And that's where we look into some steps to freedom, where we really look into some in-depth truths about what God has said, concerning negative patterns, concerning certain habits, you know, certain failures that have had people bound and things that have made people struggle to really enjoy the true freedom that God has given them. It's a video course, so it's similar to like the Alpha, but there is always, it's broken down into chunks. So you have a video section and then, um, um, and then we, we discuss, we reflect, we, we take God's truth from God's word, you know, so people are bounded by fear, by grief, by, by unforgiveness, these are patterns that have held people bound. So it's going through God's word and picking out the truth of God's word to set us free from, from such. Next slide, please. So it's three different facets of the course. So week one to seven talks about really, you know, um, exploring, like I said, the, the truth of God's word. It's test session course, and it's, it's the, the first session looks into the truth. Tenth session course revealing the truth of who we are in Christ and the reality of the spiritual battle with a lot of times to pause, you know. The good thing about the course is you have time to, to, to pause. It's not just a session where somebody just talks at you, but you pause, take God's word, reflect on God's word, speak those God's word to you, and then take charge of God's word. You know, and there's something about truth. I, I grew up thinking that the more I screamed and the more I shouted in prayers, the devil would be afraid only to recognize the fact that he is not afraid of my shouting or afraid of my sound. He's only afraid of my truth. Matthew 4, 4, Luke 4, 4, Jesus said to the devil, man does not live by bread alone. So it is the truth that sets us free. It is not the shouting. It is not the sound. And that's what this course explores. Then the, other, the, 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 the session that the, the week eight that talks about is a, we'll call it a time for spiritual MOT. So what that does, it, it's a session that looks into steps to freedom. You know, certain habits, certain thoughts, certain patterns that we have had in the past that have had us bound. We look into 
actually going through God's word and breaking through, breaking through, you know, with, 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 with God's word on, on things that we, we call it looking at our life more like a spiritual MOT. And then there is the, the transformation uh, uh, um, part, which we call the final key is stronghold bursting. You know, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5, the Bible says that the weapons of our welfare, they are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, you know, breaking down all of those imaginations and thoughts that exalt themselves against God's knowledge. The devil brings these strongholds. It is God's word that breaks through those strongholds. So the cause explores some of those, those truths, you know, by causing a renewal of minds and demolishing argument sets that he said against God. And the final slide, please, as we as I round off. So this is what the course presents. And Chris and I will be delivering this course. We've had some sign up already, so spaces are really not very limited. But we're going to run it in different cohorts. So this first cohort will be about 20-ish. And they will have different times in the, in the year. And I'm sure that it's not for just those who are getting saved. It's not for those who are new beginners. It's for I did this course after many years of being a, a Christian and even being a, a, a pastor in the church. So it's for anyone that really wants to really explore some of those negative patterns and behavior and break free, you know. So again, please go on church suite if you, suite if you are interested and register. And if you, if you, if there is an app, Freedom in Christ app, you know, where a lot of material content and in, you know, you know if you are IT survey, you can go there. Or if you, if you want to know more about it, just grab Chris and I out, um, after the service. You know, we can tell you more about it. Or at the information desk, you can t get a leaflet, you know, which you can read more about. I think God wants to really cause us to enjoy and maximize what Jesus' death did for us. He saved us from sin. We can be free from sin. We can be free from habits that hold us past. And we can be victorious in Christ. And may God bless you. Thank you so much, Andrew and Chris. Hope that's given you some insight. Thanks for your honesty and openness, Chris. We appreciate that so much. And uh, we thank God for courses like this. We believe in God for real breakthrough in people's lives and real encouragement uh, as we continue to disciple ourselves before him. Um, I'd like just to do a reading now from God's words, and I'm going to invite you, because we've been seated for a few minutes, to stand with me. We're going to put on the screen Psalm 84, and we're going to recite the psalm through together. Uh, I think it's really, really important that the word of God has a key place when God's people come together. And so very often we start the service with a reading from God's word. But I'd like you to read out loud uh, these verses with me this morning, and take a moment to read them through first quietly and let's just declare them as, as prayer, as thanksgiving, as worship, as the word of God, as God's people this morning. So let's take a moment just to read them through so we're familiar with them and then we're going to just declare and pray them as God's words together. So let's read the word of God communally this morning. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. What joy for those who live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their hearts on pilgrimage. Thank you for reading the word of God with me this morning. So very important. As you take your seats, why don't you take a moment to greet the people who are around you and welcome them to church this morning.
Well, like I've said a couple of times already, it's really lovely to um, welcome you all this morning. If you're here for the first time, a very special warm welcome to you. We have a welcome area on my right-hand side uh, at the back corner there. If you'd like to come and meet us and get to know a bit more about the church, then we would love to uh, chat with you after the service. Also, right down uh, by the cross here, there'll be people who will pray with you after the service if you'd like to receive prayer. There are a number of announcements that I need to share with you, so please bear with me. These may well be longer than the sermon, but you'll probably be delighted by that anyway. So here goes. There is a video. Uh, is it possible to see that, a youth and children's video right now, or do you want me to carry on and... Hey young people, okay? as you are well aware, summer is fast approaching and therefore we have some awesome summer camps coming up your way. Hey, can't wait. The first one is for our young people in school year 6, 7 and 8 who will be taken away to the fantastic Yorkshire camps. The date of the trip is the weekend of the 28th to the 30th of June and as you know from last year's testimonies, being away together is absolutely fantastic. It offers an opportunity to be in extra space, beautiful surroundings where we can establish friendships, deepen our relationship with Jesus, and without a doubt, create lifelong memories. So, at a cost of £64 per child, it's a great value for money. And thanks to several churches, Yorkshire Camps um, offers a bursary as well. So, there's no reason why you can't book on. So, that's Yorkshire Camps for years 6, 7 and 8. But years 9 to 13, we have some amazing news for you too. Yeah, so that's it. Year 9 to 13, we also have some incredibly exciting news for you. And that is Limitless Festival tickets are officially open. The dates are Saturday the 3rd of August all the way through to Thursday the 8th of August. You can book your space by paying your deposit and securing your spot. Head over to our website, onto our events page, where you can see all the information that you're going to need. Limitless Festival is an incredible time and opportunity for you to encounter God amongst thousands of fellow believers your age. We had some amazing testimonies from our young people last year about how they encountered God. And this is why we are opening up the event to more young people this year. However, spaces are limited and the tickets will be sold on a first come first basis. So what are you waiting for? Head over to our events page and secure your space for both events now. Woo! Thank you, dynamic duo. Uh, brilliant. Uh, thank, but do parents do take real note of that. So a number of announcements. Forgive me for these. First of all, tomorrow evening, for those who've received the email, we have our leader to leader get together with trustees and elders. Um, that's in the Stewart building and uh, you'll in the chestnut room uh, in the Stuart building, that's at 7.30 if you've had the email. Chestnut room, top floor in the Stuart building across the way. Then on Thursday of this week, there's um, a mission school. Helen Trem and uh, her team there will be leading the first week in mission school. Again, if you've signed up for that, please do remember Thursday evening. On Friday of this week, the 19th, we have the marriage enrichment evening again, and uh, you're very, very welcome to be part of that. Uh, you can sign up online, uh, or you can sign up, um, I think there is a, actually a sign up form at the welcome desk for that. On the 23rd of April, we have the care for uh, the family evening, or Tuesday at 7.30. That again is marriage enrichment. It's a really, really great evening, very professionally done. Really wants to encourage you to be part of that. And then on the 26th of April is our half night of prayer between 10 and 2 p.m. Half night of prayer. If you can come for an hour or half an hour or a couple of hours or the whole time, we would love to have you with us as we pray for the church and for the city and for lots of other areas as well. So do be with us on Friday the 26th of April from 10 in the evening until 2 in the morning. And I think... That might be everything, but I guess I'll get a bit of paper if it isn't. I think that's everything I'm supposed to mention to you. So we're going to take some time now to worship God with our gifts and our offerings and to worship in our sung worship. 
Now, it might be that you're a guest or a visitor. You haven't come prepared for an offering. That's perfectly okay. Don't worry about it. Just let the basket go by. Uh, but for those of us who are regulars, it's part of our worship. And Marie and the team are going to lead us in a, a, a time of sung worship this morning. As we do that, we're going to bring our gifts and offerings to the Lord. So over to you, Marie. Shall we all stand? Could not get past my blame till he called my name. I'm so glad he changed me. Darkness held me down, but Jesus pulled me out. I'm no longer bound. I'm so glad he's changed me. See, I'm now a new creation in Christ. Yes, it's mine. 
A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all have gone before us, and all who will believe and sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Let's just sing that again. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all is gone before us, and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Sing your name. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. All thrones and positions, all paths and positions.
God, our Father, it really is our prayer. And we don't always find it easy. We get caught up and preoccupied with the things of everyday life, sometimes even of church life. But that's our heart's prayer. Because we know that when everything else is gone and all the distractions are closed off, you have put in our hearts a hunger for Jesus to be the centre. We pray Jesus be the centre of my life, not simply as a song with a great melody and with good words, but as a heart cry. Yes, Lord. We want Jesus at the centre of our life. And Lord, as we as leaders have shared and prayed and sought so often, we pray for our church. Jesus, be the centre of this church. There are so many other things that could take your place, our reputation, the things that you do through us for the glory and honour of your name, the way in which sometimes people are drawn to the ministries that you have birthed here, and it would be so easy for them to take priority and for you to be sidelined. But we pray, Jesus, be the centre of this church. Lord, present yourself amongst us in great power and authority. May the Lordship and the rule and reign of Jesus never be in any doubt amongst us. And may all the glory always, always, always go to you. So, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you praise and thanks this day. And we ask your blessing upon our time together. Amen. Amen. Please do take your seats. And the Lord bless you. Um, we're going to do something very, very quick, just for a moment or two, just a bit different. We're going to put a slide up about what we shared uh, on last week. And now some of you weren't here last week, so apologies to you, but the scripture that we shared on last week will go on the wall. And those of you who were here last week just got really two very, very simple questions. Um, first of all, uh, what can you remember about what we said about the verse that we looked at last week, which is Matthew 5, 3 and 4? And secondly, was there something that you took away? Um, I'm hoping that somebody remembers something from last week. I'm hoping that somebody took something away from last week, but maybe you haven't, so if not, just talk amongst yourselves. But I would really like you to just have a look at these, this verse uh, from Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the next one, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And maybe there's something you remember from last week, something that has stayed with you from last week, why don't you just take a few minutes to share that with the person next to you. Now, if you're here for the first time, or if you're one of those private people, as I am, and you don't particularly want to share with the person next to you, will you just please feel free to say, I'm going to do this on my own, and no one will be upset with you, okay? You just do your own thing. Um, but if you're with someone that you know and you feel comfortable, just share with them. But please feel free not to have to do that if you don't want to. You have two or three minutes just to look at those verses. Thank you. Matthew 5, verses 3 and 4. Okay, thank you. We'll bring that to a close. And uh, we're going to move on in the study this week. I hope that it was something that you remembered, something 
that you took away. But we're going to move uh, on. I'm going to read the passage again. So if you have a Bible or a phone or a tablet or whatever, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 1 down to verse 12. Matthew 5 from verse 1 down to verse 12. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Last week we began this short series on the Beatitudes as they're found in Matthew's Gospel here in chapter 5. We noticed, I hope, that they are not just beautiful attitudes as some people refer to them, perhaps a convenient way of describing them. But actually Jesus is talking about what it means to live kingdom life as a member, as it were, of his kingdom. It's how life should be lived in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's extraordinary teaching, because to the surprise of its original hearers, and to the surprise, perhaps, of us who are here today, Jesus' teaching turns the world's values and its aims right upside down. We saw last week that those who are aware of their own spiritual poverty outside of God's gracious help are blessed people, happy people. And obviously the people of Jesus' day just could not understand that. They would assume that the people who'd got it right from a religious perspective, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, Levites and the priests, surely these were the blessed people. But Jesus says, no. The people who are aware of their own spiritual bankruptcy and have put all their faith and trust in God to do for them what they cannot do for themselves, they are the blessed people. And in the same way, we saw last week, blessed are those who mourn. <clears throat> it's a ridiculous suggestion. Aren't the people who don't mourn the ones who are blessed and happy? But Jesus is saying, no, look, those who mourn at the things God's heart mourns at, those people are blessed. Because in the end, God will bring about what they cannot bring about for themselves. But when they come to the end of their own resources and their trust and faith is in God, He will do for them, through Jesus, what they cannot do for themselves. It's the Master's own teaching about the people who are truly blessed from God's perspective. And to a watching world, the values of this kingdom of Jesus may seem completely upside down and completely strange. But godly wisdom is, in the end, the only way to live that brings us into deep relationship with God himself. Someone has expressed these different kingdom values in this unusual way. We want the war horse. Jesus rides on a donkey. We want the eagle. The Holy Spirit comes amongst us as a dove. We want to take up swords. Jesus takes up the cross. We want a roaring lion. God comes as a slaughtered lamb. We keep trying to arm God. God keeps trying to disarm us. Now those words may be applicable more in some cultures than they are in others, but there is truth in them. Jesus' culture is upside-down culture in the world in which we live. And so this week we move on to two more statements that we find here in Matthew chapter 5. And I think there is a contrast with the first two. I think it could be argued that the first two that we've mentioned 
are kind of almost internal. They can be hidden things that we find inside of us, those who are poor in spirit and those who mourn. But the next two, I think, will be recognised in our lives by other people. Last week's message could be titled, Poor and Mourning. But this week's message, I hope, can be titled, Meek and Hungry. So let me come to verse 5, where Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Many years ago, an American journalist, just for fun, created an organisation called Doormats. D-O-O-R-M-A-T-S. It stood for Dependent Organisation of Really Meek and Timid Souls. Dependent Organisation of Really Meek and Timid Souls. And it had a wonderful strap line, which was this. The meek shall inherit the earth, and then in brackets underneath, if nobody else minds. And that's often our picture of meekness. We think of meek people of kind of of unimposing, uh, perhaps over-gentle kind of person who is weak, who gives in to everything and everyone and doesn't make a stand for what they want or what they believe in. But that is not what Jesus is talking about when he talks about meekness. Meekness is not weakness as far as Jesus is concerned. Rather, meekness for him is the ability to control strength and power. I want to suggest to you that at various times in our life, every one of us needs to hear those words. Meekness, as far as the kingdom is concerned, is the ability to control strength and power. Jesus says, blessed are the strong people who can contain how they respond to others. And they don't simply use their power to defeat them. Or if you like, happy is the person who is not controlled by his emotions or her emotions, but is able through God's grace to control them in a way which honours Jesus. Isn't that very challenging? Meekness, then, is strength and power under control. And that is what Jesus himself is like. In Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus describes himself as meek and lowly, or meek and and humble but we know he is not and was not without strength power and authority there is that moment in the garden of gethsemane when jesus has been arrested and you know the story how peter draws his sword and he's immediately into action and he he slices off the high priest's servant's ear and jesus immediately heals the man's ear and makes it right and then he turns to peter and he says this peter put up your sword do you think that i cannot call on my father and he'll immediately put at my disposal 12,000 angels and then jesus adds these words but If I did that, how then would be the scripture be fulfilled that says it must happen this way? See, one day, friends, in an incredible and total and complete way, Jesus will inherit the earth. And you and I, who are Jesus' followers, born again by the Spirit of God and by the grace of God, we will inherit the earth with him. He has promised us this, but we will do it God's way and not by force. In Matthew chapter 4, Satan comes to Jesus, and he says to him, if you will bow down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth, and it must have been a possibility, otherwise it wouldn't have been a real temptation. But Jesus says, get away from me, Satan, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only there was a moment a possibility when calvary might not have been necessary when there was an easier way for him to inherit the kingdom of the earth but jesus said not not my way not my will be done but your way because the kingdom of god doesn't come through the force or the power or the authority or the demands or the controlling of men and women whoever they are it comes through the obedience of men and women who love Jesus as his kingdom and his power flows through them. Jesus, in humility and meekness, controls his own power so that the purposes of God can be fulfilled on earth. Perhaps that's more important for us than we've ever understood. When through the Spirit's power 
And through the lordship of Jesus, we control our anger or frustration or our deep emotions. We enable the kingdom to come in ways that we might not even realize because we've controlled our power and our strength and submitted it to the lordship of Christ and the purposes of the Godhead. You see, the meekness of Jesus could be described as a lifestyle totally submitted to the Father's way of doing things. He would not accomplish anything other than what was the will of God the Father. Now we all know that in the values of this world, a politician or a businessman, and very sadly on occasions, a church leader or pastor, throws their weight around by force of personality, sometimes by financial power, sometimes by coercion or manipulation to get exactly what he or she wants. This is how the world works. And when Christians act in this way, when pastors act in this way, it is simply compliance with the world's system and the world's values. It is not kingdom behavior. We need to call it out and recognize it for what it is. But in contrast, Jesus has declared the meek will inherit the earth. Listen, not might do, not, forgive me, fingers crossed, not I hope they will, I hope you'll inherit the earth. Listen, Jesus says the meek will inherit the earth. There is a day coming when with Christ we will rule and reign. Writing in Galatians 5, Paul is inspired by the Holy Spirit to say that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and kindness and self-control. And if we take his word seriously, there is a summary of how to live kingdom life as the Holy Spirit enables us under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. They are, if you like, the litmus test of whether kingdom life is in you or in me. And I ask myself again today, isn't that how Jesus lived? Isn't that how I should be living? I remember the words of Graham Kendrick's very beautiful hymn. Lord of infinity, stooping so tenderly, <clears throat> lifts our humanity to the heights of his throne. Oh, what a mystery. Meekness and majesty, bow down and worship, for this is your God. And if meekness is what our God is like, if what Jesus is like, then it ought to be what you and I are as well. So let me say this to you this morning, if I may. Once again, we see the upside down nature of kingdom values. But remember the meek, they're blessed you are blessed this morning if you are meek followers of the Lord Jesus Christ because one day through Jesus, God will do for you what you have no chance ever of doing for yourself. So as you interact with family or friends or neighbours or workmates or whoever it is during this coming week, don't throw your weight around. Control how you respond. Husbands, please do that. Wives, please do that so that you'll be a true witness to the Lord Jesus, who is himself meek and lowly in heart, and with whom one day we will, according to the promise of Jesus, inherit the earth. And then in verse 6, we read, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. I read a disturbing article. Let me just digress for a few moments, and I'll come back to this. I read a disturbing article this week from Oxfam on their website that told me that today in the world there are 30 million people in a world of plenty that are starving. The, the article is entitled Hunger in a World of Plenty. Hunger in a World of Plenty. 30 million people are starving. Now this morning when I got up I had a banana and a pear and a small piece of fruit loaf. And quite frankly... I'm really hungry just at the moment. <laughs> and if you were sitting up there like Andrew was, I might just say to you, you know, I'm starving. The tragedy of my use of those words is it means I haven't had anything for a couple of hours. When Oxfam and Cofford and Tear Fund and Save the Children and others 
when they say starving, they talk about people who will not eat today, who didn't eat yesterday, who didn't eat the, yes, yes, the day before and have no chance of eating tomorrow. 30 million of them. Now, this is not primarily what this passage is about, but we are children of the Most High God, children of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I hope you'll excuse me for asking this, but I wonder if it's possible. There's no rule. I'm just wondering. Could as many of us as possible go online this week and give however little we're able to to the people of our world who have absolutely nothing? Even five pounds would make a difference. Imagine if four or five hundred of us were to give five pounds or ten pounds just this week. Countries particularly affected, according to Oxfam, are northeast Nigeria, Ethiopia, South Sudan, Yemen and Gaza, and you can add to that this, this week, Haiti, the island which is so permeated by occult practice and which is in such desperate need. Can I encourage you also, take time to pray about what you can do. Pray for peace. I'll say more about that later in this mini-series. Write to your MP. Join online petitions. Friends, 30 million people may be depending on us. We have a role to play. However, in these words, it's not physical hunger and thirst, but spiritual that Jesus is talking about. There are several commentators who think that Jesus is referring back to Psalm 42, that great psalm of the sons of Korah, which you'll be familiar with. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. It's the hunger, if you like, of people who are not satisfied with their spiritual condition and who want more of God and more of his presence in their lives. We don't normally mix the ideas of people being hungry and happy, but Jesus says, you're blessed. If you're, ha you're blessed, you're happy. If you have an appetite for God and for his righteousness, that is a great place to be. I think, you know, that for many sincere Christians, there comes a moment in our lives when suddenly, I can only describe it as this, there is a divine dissatisfaction that begins to gnaw away at us on the inside. We've been sleepwalking along quite happily and, and life has been good and then suddenly spiritual hunger pains grip us on the inside and we realise that we need more of him and we need more of his spirit and we need more of his power, and we need more of his presence, and we need more of his grace, that we need more of Jesus. We need more of his spirit. We need more than we've experienced so far. I remember so clearly the words of John Piper on a book many years ago that really gripped my heart and touched me. And he, he talks on the cover of one of his books, he says this, the trouble with so many Western believers is we have nibbled at the table of this world and we've become full of small things. We've nibbled at the table of this world and we've become full of small things. Hands up, guilty. I've done that on many occasions. Satisfied by less than everything God wants to do in me and through me and for me and for his glory. And I come back to asking myself, is it true for me? Do I regularly nibble at the table of this world and so fill myself with small things that there isn't any hunger left for the things of God? I trust not. But if it is you, if you are hungry this morning, don't despair. Remember Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. It's not a criticism, it's an invitation. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, after God himself after his righteous way of living and of being, because God's promised, they will be filled. And here again, when we see hunger, we realise that God is what God wants. We are happy because God in Jesus is able to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. But we're blessed. We're blessed if we're hungering and thirsting because that righteousness, for, hungering for righteousness is not a natural human desire. And if this morning you are hungering and thirsting after God, be happy, be blessed, God will answer. You see, today in this city, there are hundreds and there are thousands of people who don't care at all about God or his love or his righteousness or his purposes. They just want to live in this dark old world. But this morning, if you do care, it's because of a work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and life. 
If you care, if you are aware of your own hunger for God and for his righteous ways, it's because you're still sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit in you, calling you on further and deeper and deeper. And that's news to make you happy. So, friends, the Beatitudes, yes, they're beautiful attitudes, but there's so much more than that. And in his day and in our day, Jesus comes with a new teaching, a teaching that's so different from the world. It's the teaching of God's kingdom, breaking in here on earth, but with the promise, with the promise that one day when there's a new heaven and a new earth, everyone on earth will live this way because that's God's kingdom purpose. It's a message of hope in place of the sorrow so many have experienced. It's a message with the promise of a future life like we have never known before. Interestingly, it's a message for people like you and me who have nothing to offer God in return but will face up to their weakness and failure and trust in the transforming power of his word and spirit. In this upside-down kingdom in which I live and you live, the blessings come to the poor in spirit. Those who know that outside of God's grace and mercy, they haven't a hope in the future. They're blessed because God himself has stepped in through Christ and he will step in and be their help and their strength. The blessing comes to those who mourn for the things that God grieves about because one day God has promised through Jesus to wipe away every tear from their eyes. And we have an eternal future without tears and without sorrow, without pain and without separation. It's the promise of God through Jesus Christ. It comes to the meek, those who don't impose their power on others, but humbly trust God because one day they're going to experience what only God can do for them. They'll inherit the earth. And the blessings and the happiness of the kingdom also come to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for God himself and for the truth of his way of living and of being. Life in Jesus' day was very hard. To live for him was tougher than I think we can begin to imagine, even very dangerous, just as it is for many people in our world today. Tough, hard. Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, said Jesus. Blessed are you. And we say, how can that be blessed? And here's the answer, because we're not only living for this life, are we? We're living by God's grace for an eternal future that is only available through him. In other words, life may be very hard now. And life is at times a complete mystery to us all. Bad things happen to good people. And bad people seem to get away with bad things for now. But friends, however it feels this morning, if you are in Christ Jesus, you are happy and you are blessed. Because one day we'll begin to spend eternity with the Lord Jesus himself. And on that day, God our Father, working by his Spirit through Jesus, will do for us what we could never have done for ourselves. So thank you, Father, and thank you, Jesus, and thank you, Holy Spirit. And may we all know the joy of living for and living in the grace of God. And may we serve him with all our hearts until he comes again. Amen. I want to pray with you this morning. I want to pray with you this morning just very briefly as the worship team come up. Thank you to them. Thank you to AV and PA and ushers, car park people again for today. Thank you so much. Here's a song we're going to sing. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things. I just want to say we need to pray this truth, just as Chris shared with us earlier, and Andrew too. Andrew said it wasn't our volume, it's our truth that the enemy is afraid of. So true. It's not our volume, it's our truth. So we need to hear the truth and live the truth. Let's just pray for a moment. Then, Mary, would you leave us in this closing song? Father God, we pray.
that we'll have hearts so open to spirit and word that your truth will truly abide in us as we abide in you. We pray that we won't go from this place and simply forget, but through the Holy Spirit's witness, we will retain and remember and live out the things that you want us to share and to know. God, would you change our lives by spirit and word as we bow the knee to you? Help us to live in truth, not to shout it, but to so live it that it speaks for the glory and honour of Jesus. May we live lives that reflect your kingdom until that glorious day when you come and we see you face to face. Amen.
with this in mind, we constantly pray for you, that our God may make you worthy of his calling, and that by his power, he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him, according to the grace of our Lord and our God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord bless you today and through this week in his precious name. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Crucify.